Thank you, Lori. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. We had a uh, had a wonderful uh, week here uh, at the church. It was uh, it was the return it was the return of Vacation Bible School, and uh, you know you don't you don't realize the. Uh, the joy, um, you know, when you when you start to see all the the children come in, how much they've grown over this uh, time where we haven't seen them, uh, where you start to see the families, uh, you know, uh, after all this time, it really was quite a uh, quite a joy, and um, it was a, a great joy as well to see once again uh, the church body uh, come together, every single person, unit working together uh, as a team, uh, just serving God in so many different capacities, the number of things happening here uh, in order to uh, make uh, the, the week successful, uh, just astounding. So to, uh, to each and every person who uh, gave up their time uh, sacrificially, uh, gave, you know, worked so hard giving up their bodies and their minds and everything sacrificially uh just a, a great big thank you um uh, you know to know that it was all done not for our own uh, glory at all but to uh, the glory and honor of our lord was uh, amazing i think bruce uh, reported online on our website that uh, we had from 33 to uh, 44 children throughout the week if I recall correctly, if Brenda recalled correctly, I'm just repeating. Uh, we, we had a big day with 37 kids and nine youth. Is that right? And uh, anyway, if you were to uh, be here this past week to see the youth uh, lined up here uh, with Lori uh, doing the music, the songs, uh, just incredible. And to see them in, a, in every capacity, the young people uh, working with um, these children throughout the week, what a, what a joy that was. So it's, uh, it, was, it was quite incredible. Thank you again to, uh, to everyone. What a, what, what a wonderful week. Um, uh, with that, uh, we have uh, Awana 
that'll be <laughs> begin before we know it, uh, September 7th, um, from what, 6.30 to, no, 6, six to 7.30. 6 Thank you. It's been so long. And, uh, and then that same week, September the 10th, right? Uh, youth group returning as well from 6 to 8. Do I have those times correct? All right. And, uh, you know, to anyone listening out there, uh, you know, go on our, uh, go on the King City Bible Church uh, website. All those uh, dates and times are, are there for you. Just look in the church news uh, section and you'll see that. Thank you to Bruce for doing that. Uh, right? Keeping up that website. So we appreciate that. We, uh, for those who, uh, for those of you who are watching the live stream, we're, we're very light here today. <laughs> it's a very, very empty room. You may hear me echo. Um, it, it's very light. So we have some folks, uh, a lot of folks out today uh, who can't make it uh, or who are traveling. So we, uh, not only are we light, but those who are here are only on this side. So if you see me out there on the live stream, just looking this way, you know, uh, no one over here. Uh, there's still time. Come on out. Fill the seats. You know, if you're listening from home, we'd, uh, we'd love to have you here this morning. We're going go to we're gonna go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's, uh, let's do that before we continue. Uh, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this past week. Uh, you're allowing us the opportunity, affording us the opportunity, as you have so many times, to uh, minister to the children of this community, uh, to uh, minister to the families uh, that came out. It was, it, it just it fills our hearts with a great joy, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for uh, your people uh, being willing to serve and to, uh, to sacrifice uh, uh, time uh, to be able to, uh, to do so, uh, to work and, and serve you in the capacity that that they did, uh, just, uh, Lord, uh, we just ask for your blessing on those who um, they gave the time to set up, to work throughout the week, who prayed from home, who, who uh, took everything uh, down and got everything ready for the service this morning, Lord, um, we just, uh, I just thank you uh, to see your body working together is, uh, in unity. Um, you know, for a common purpose is just uh, an incredible thing, and we thank you that you're at the center of it all, Lord. We uh, we pray for our brother Bruce this morning. Uh, may your healing touch, Lord, be upon him. We pray that you'd be with uh, Sue as well and continue to work healing, Lord, in her eyes. And uh, we uh, pray for those uh, who are traveling and uh, and need to be elsewhere this morning. Ed, so. Uh, Tim, Randy, Lord, um, we just uh, lift them up to you, Lord, in, in prayer. We're, uh, we're so thankful for those who are, who are here and able to be here this morning. Uh, pray that this time that we have would be pleasing to you. May our, uh, our time of worship just uh, magnify your name. Uh, may it, there be a good time of preparation, Lord, for uh, the time of communion that follows. Again, we just uh, lift this morning to you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we uh, invite you who are uh, listening, uh, viewing from home, uh, will be uh, uh, observing communion at the, uh, after the message this morning. So if you take the time to prepare those elements for yourselves at home, uh, that would be wonderful. I want uh, all, all of us to be able to uh, participate. Well, I have been a, I've had a series that I've titled the uh, the call. We've been looking at that over these uh, past weeks. Uh, we were back in the Old Testament in the Book of Isaiah, uh, chapter six. We uh, came to the New Testament last time uh, in the Gospel of uh, Luke, uh, chapter sixteen, and uh, we find ourselves uh, this morning in the Gospel of John, and we're going to be looking at the fourth chapter. And we've asked the questions over these past weeks regarding the call. Uh, do you hear the call from heaven? We also asked the question, do you hear the call from hell? 
uh, was a very sobering question uh, last time. And this morning, uh, the question to our hearts is, do we hear the call from the harvest? And for that, again, we're in the Gospel of, uh, of John. And uh, we're going to, uh, I'm, I think I'm going to read through uh, a good portion of this so we get the context of uh, the 35th uh, verse, uh, which will be a focus this morning. So, um, John chapter 4, uh, we'll just start right at the beginning, uh, the, where the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact, it was not uh, Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, we're told in verse 4. So he came up to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well. It was about the sixth hour. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Well, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you are now, uh, the man you now have is not your husband. Uh, what you have just said is quite true. Uh, verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus de declared, I who speak to you am he. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want? Or you know, why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who's told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say? Four months more, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crops for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans, verse 39, 
from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word for us this morning. There's the context. We've, um, Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 35, uh, again, don't you have a saying? Uh, you know, it's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. So we see here, uh, the whole context of this is the woman at the well, and the Samaritan woman we see was an immoral woman who, uh, you know, was married five times. She was living with a man that wasn't her husband. Jesus met her, we read in the text, and he leads her along that path of uh, truth. Uh, so we saw in our reading there, after offering the woman living water, Jesus did what? First confronted her uh, with her sin, then steered her away from any religious debates, that being the proper place to worship, right, the, in the middle of our text there, and then unveiled himself to her as a true Messiah. And then we see there in the text that she's wonderfully changed uh, by the supernatural power of God, and she believes in Jesus as the Messiah. And then we saw in verses 28 and 30, she left her water jar, went back to town, told the people, come and see him. Uh, you know, and they came out of the town and they all made their way toward him. So let's look back at the actual setting. Again, what Jesus says to his own disciples, his own friends, those who followed him, he's saying, open your eyes and look. And this woman had gone, she preached the gospel from her very own personal experience, and she's telling the people in her town, and now they're all coming down the road toward Jesus. And as this crowd is coming down the road, that's when Jesus says, you know, why would, why would you say the harvest is another four months away? Look at all the people coming, he says to his disciples. Now is the harvest time, right? The harvest was the Samaritans. You know, I don't know what the disciples were looking at, but, but they, they, they weren't looking at the crowd of Samaritans coming down the road. Open your eyes, he says. Lift up your eyes. You know, and maybe that's where the question comes to us. Friends, what, what are we looking at? Um, you know, what do we see? Do we see as a church, as individuals, do we see the, the harvest field ready? Do we see the harvest field ripe uh, for picking now? Um, uh, because that's what Jesus says it is. Jesus said the fields are ready for harvest now, now. But to see and to, uh, to hear the call of uh, the harvest, which we're looking at this morning, we need to have responded to another call. The call of discipleship. We, need, we have to respond to the call of discipleship. Many are saved, we know that, uh, but they've never answered that call of discipleship. Jesus said, uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 23 and 24, and uh, again, for those of you uh, watching the live stream, uh, Brittany is very faithfully uh, in the booth back there this morning. We want to thank her for that. Uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 23 and 20, uh, 24, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will save it. And that, that's going back to the first part of this series. That's going back to Isaiah chapter 6, the, the, the first part of verse 1. You might remember that, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, right? And so you might remember from when we began this that for Isaiah to hear and respond to the call, something had to die in his life. Remember? Is it coming back? 
you know, he, something had to die in his life that was getting in the way. You know, for Isaiah, it was an idolatrous uh, substitute, something that was keeping him in that comfortable place, that's, that status quo. And that's the call of discipleship to all of us. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Um, it, it's, we need to die out to certain things and to ourselves, not, not our true selves, but to our selfish desires and to our motive, you know, those selfish motivations, those need to die out um, so that we can respond to the call. And when we've answered that call of discipleship, then once we've done that, that's when we hear the call for help. And that's what the call from the harvest is. The call from the harvest is a call for help. That's, that, that's what it is. All right, uh, uh, you might recall that this happened to Paul, Acts chapter 16. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, uh, we see Luke uh, telling us in verses 9 uh, and 10 of that chapter that during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, the text says, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul sees this man, this vision of this man pleading for help to come and harvest this particular part of the world and immediately got ready to leave for there. He was so certain that this vision was of God that he obeyed immediately and the, the company got ready and the next day we're off. Uh, now, some of you may be hearing a, a call, and again, this is for those who are not only present here, uh, who are watching this uh, from home, probably hearing a call or a cry, maybe not from Macedonia, right, but from another place. Well, well where is it? You know, some of you are hearing a call from part of God's uh, harvest field, but, and you know, you know exactly where it is. Right? Even if you don't obey that cry and that call and go to the mission field or, or something like that, you know, many of us aren't likely to do that. Mission organizations still need our help, right? They have to get our help. So that Macedonian call is constantly coming to us, constantly. Uh, you know, so the question is, well, can you help? Can I help even if we don't go into the mission field? I mean, you look at where we are, you know, and, you know, are we going to do that? How can we do that? Um, in the, uh, and this was staggering to me, I was sharing with uh, Brenda the other day uh, when I was researching this. In the, in the 2000 years, is since the great commission that, that Jesus gave, right? Go into all the world, right? Preach, preach the gospel. To, to all nations, right? You know, uh, there are still, and it's a staggering number, there are still two billion souls who've never heard, you know, who still haven't heard the name of Christ for the first time. Staggering. I, you know, I, to think that they don't know who Jesus is, uh, now, I'm not talking about political countries. I, I believe that every political country has heard the, the name of Christ. But I'm talking about people groups within those countries. You know, uh, estimates, and again, I was startled by it, but estimates suggest that there are 7,400 people groups who are considered unreached. And that means uh, they, you know, if they're if we're putting a definition to that uh, that term unreached, that means that less than two percent of that people group are true Christ followers, and less than five percent professing Christians. Now, when I say professing Christians, that may not necessarily mean that they're a true believer. They may just say they're a Christian. I mean, 
That means that over 40% of the world's people groups have absolutely no indigenous community of believing Christians who are able to evangelize the rest of their people group. Uh, you know, that means that over 42% of the world's population live in these over 7,400 people groups. And again, this does not mean that every individual within an unreached people group have never heard of Jesus or his uh, wonderful gospel message of salvation. Uh, there's probably, like I said, a small percentage, less than 2% of Christ followers in these groups, but the vast majority of the group has minimal, if any, exposure at all to the person of Jesus and his good news, his gospel. Uh, you know, if, if you're to make, uh, not just, uh, well, maybe before I even say that, I would, had also looked at the research concerning the, uh, the 50, just the 50 largest uh, unreached people groups and within the 50 I believe I read that 47 of them are in are in countries that are uh, restricted or just closed altogether this is not easy now we're starting to see the scope of the Great Commission and I, I remember I was just telling the Great Commission right we were just talking about it with the children this past week in vacation Bible school and I knew it when I was telling them. The scope of the commission, it's great. If you were to make, not just a convert, right? But what are we supposed to do as a church? What's the commission? To make disciples, right? But to make a disciple of Jesus, it requires the scriptures to be available in the native tongue, in that mother tongue. So I read that approximately 1,800 languages have definite translation need. That's staggering. And that means that for those speakers of those 1,800 languages, no scripture exists at all. I mean, you know, now they may have, they may have limited access uh, to the scriptures and, you know, in the larger major languages or in trade or, or, or then there, but no access in their, uh, in their heart language, I guess we would, might say. Um, you know, the languages, of course, with the larger number of speakers have been translated, but that still leaves millions of, of individuals who still don't have the scriptures in their, uh, in that mother tongue. And even if the scriptures are translated, even if like, news media becomes uh, available, then Brenda and I were talking about it, there's at least one billion adults who are not formally educated, meaning they're not gonna be able to read the scriptures once they're given them. Extremely low literacy rates are concentrated in, uh, in the Arab states, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in South and West uh, Asia, all highly unreached regions as far as people groups. And then it went further. I, as I, I discovered that, you know, 60% of the world's population are considered oral learners. Right? Uh, that's their preferred learning mode. Right? So, you know, they're not interested in written at all. You know, some estimates suggest that up to 70% of all the unreached peoples of the world, oral preference communicators. So for those that are non-readers, for those who are oral learners, it doesn't matter whether you give them a newspaper or a book or any sort of, you know, printed matter. It doesn't matter whether they have access to internet text. It doesn't matter. Even a physical Bible in their hands will have very minimal impact. Staggering, isn't it? I was, um, uh, Brenda and I were uh, talking, I talk with Brenda a lot, uh, because, you know, it, it, it helps. Uh, but, you know, you know that Brenda had gone to Africa, um, and uh, it was not a vacation, but it was to trace, uh, you know, the kind of walk in the footsteps of her grandparents who were missionaries there. 
uh, Brenda's grandmother uh, specifically had been working to translate uh, the Bible in a specific dialect. Um, the uh, Mission Council Committee uh, told them in the early 1980s to stop working on that particular dialect and to start working on another one. Uh, I bring this to your attention because it's only recently Remember, I, they were asked to change the dialect and work on that in the early 1980s, and it's only recently uh, that uh, there's been the completion of the first five books of the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, and then all the New Testament, all the New Testament in that dialect. Now, that's an accomplishment. However, 40 years. A team of people working on one dialect, 40 years, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing, it, it's just amazing. Uh, anyway, all of this requires uh, resources and uh, Jesus said, uh, of course, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You know, and then we start looking as believers, where are our treasures, where are our priorities? For us as a church, you know, we have a certain percentage uh, of uh, our finances that are spent on ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. We have ministries here. Uh, there's a certain percentage of our uh, finances that go to already uh, reached people around the world. There's nothing wrong with that. They need to be discipled. You know, we have to keep doing that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, it, it's staggering still to think, though, that uh, for every dollar of Christian resources, that less than a penny, less than a penny, is directed at reaching unreached people. It, it's hard. It's really difficult uh, to reach some people in this world. You know, uh, we, not, we may not be able to go, uh, but we can certainly uh, continue to give to others who do go. Um, it was amazing, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, just the number of people in order to go and reach those people groups who haven't heard the name of Christ at all, they'd have to risk everything, everything. The very lives. Not many of us will be asked to give of our lives like that. Uh, but some will uh, in order to, uh, and they'll answer that call uh, in order to reach those people. Anyway. This is all uh, uh, incredibly uh, uh, overwhelming uh, upon my heart. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you hear uh, the, the call? The call from heaven. Remember the call from heaven that we looked at? Will you go? Who will we send? Do we hear the call from hell that we talked about last week? Send! Send! And lest my brothers come to this place of torment. Remember that? And do we hear the call from the harvest that we're talking about this morning? Don't say there are yet four months, but open your eyes, look to the fields, they're ripe. They're ready. Ripe already to harvest. Come over, help us. And uh, friends, these are the, these are the calls. Uh, and the question is, are, are these the calls that are on our heart? You know, what's the call that we're answering uh, day by day? We want to make this personal. Um, I think, um, you know, there's probably calls that many people are responding to every day. I think one of the calls that we see a lot of people responding to every, what, would we, what, what else can we call it but the call to the wild, right? <laughs> I mean, you think about it, it's what some people are just following. And it's, sometimes it's what we follow too, to be honest. You know, we you know, we're, we follow the flesh, you know, we're, we're following the world, we're following even sometimes, and we talked about this when we were in Ephesians chapter 6, sometimes we're just following the voice of the enemy at times uh, in our lives, you know, in, in, right into temptation, you know, and, and everything. Um, you know, it, it sounds staggering, but often we, uh, you know, we listen and, and follow and obey the insinuations and all and the prompts and everything else the accusations from the enemy uh, in our lives in the trials in the temptations and what we think about life and 
in what we think about ourselves and what we think about God and everything. Maybe it's not the call of the wild at all. Maybe it's the call of comfort that distracts us, right? I, I think that can be very distracting. You know, the call of, I don't know why I'm looking over here. <laughs> There's no one there. <laughs> not talking to anyone over there, but the, maybe it's the, that call, that call of comfort, of ease, of materialism, and, and all of that. Some people just are very in tune with the call of uh, afflu affluence and, and everything that they can gain in that way. Uh, and then, of course, the seed of the word, the seed of the call that we're talking about, like Jesus's parable taught, is just choked by all the uh, riches and uh, the care of other things. For some people, it's the call of their career. For other people, it's the call of pleasure, the call of care, the call of worry, the call of fear, all of those. But the question to our hearts is, what voice are you listening to? What voice am I listening to? Um, it's absolutely vital that, that his call, his call, God's call, it comes to our heart directly from God. It has to be. You know, we, we, we might be hearing the call of, of, you know, we have to be hearing the call of God from him. That doesn't say, you know, you might say, well, yeah, of course. What I'm trying to say is we don't want to be motivated uh, as a church. We don't want to be motivated out of guilt. We don't want to be motivated out of shame, right? And we certainly don't want to be uh, motivated just out of an emotional response, right? You know, I gave all those uh, estimates and, uh, you know, percentages and, um, you know, maybe the, the, um, there's a great emotional response to that. That's not our motivation. It can't be that. It has to be more than that. It, it can't be motivated by the need. I was just talking about that great need, the overwhelming scope of what it is to reach all those people groups who've never heard uh, the name of Christ. But if you were just motivated by the need, and we're motivated by the need alone, I mean, we'll, we'll become discouraged. We'll become depressed. We'll become a basket case, right? You can't do that, you know, because the need is so great. You were hearing me say it. I mean, we're like, it's staggering. The need is so great. And there's only one set of shoulders that's able to carry the weight of the world, and it's not yours, and it's not mine. It's only Christ. Every, every single call that we've mentioned already, the call from heaven, the call from hell, the call from the harvest, and every single call within the word of God, I mean, there's many more, but every single call from there came through God's revelation. The call from heaven in Isaiah chapter 6, what happened? Isaiah gets a vision. And whether he was in body or out of body, I don't know what the case was there, but he gets a vision, and it's a direct revelation from God. The call from heaven. God gives it right to his heart. And even, even before Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah must have been hearing from God because he was a prophet, uh, you know, uh, whatever the sins of his mouth were that needed to be cleansed and, and purified. Then we went to Luke chapter 16 last week. We looked at the cry from hell, and that was a story told by Jesus. And I said, I believe it's probably a, a real story, but it was told as a story by Jesus. So it came directly to the disciples. It came directly to us by Jesus. Direct revelation. You know, that, that's what we're seeing there. The call to the harvest that we see here in, in John chapter 4 this morning came from Jesus. You know, he had to get the disciples to open and lift up their eyes and see the Samaritans coming. The Macedonian call to Paul in, in Ephesians. I feel like I'm rhyming again. Like, <laughs> But the Macedonian call to the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16, what was it? It, it was a visitation in a night vision. It was, see, it's all coming through revelation, these calls. It's, it's really incredible when you start looking at it all together. You know, if you, if you think you're, you're, you're hearing from God, um, even though 
immediate obedience, like Paul and his company, it can be a very good thing. Uh, you know, we also don't want to have a, a, like a knee-jerk reaction, I guess. In, in Mark chapter 3, verse 14, Mark 3, 14, it says, He, Jesus, appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Right? So there's the understanding that in everything that we're talking about today, that you have to be with Jesus to know what Jesus is calling you to. And it comes through revelation, right? You know, he appointed the 12 that they might be with him, that's first. And then that he might send them out to preach. We have to be with him first. We have to. You know, that's where the revelation comes, so we know what we're doing. Obviously, you know, we need workers in church. <laughs> we need workers in church. You know, we have to have the workers in the church. This past week was a fine example. Um, we always have fine examples, but we had, uh, it, it, was, it was really incredible uh, to see. Uh, but so often, uh, you know, unfortunately, God isn't always in, involved in a lot of things that are, uh, uh, that are going on. We, we, we need to go to God. We need to be uh, alone with Jesus. Jesus first called them to be with him, and then, uh, then he sent them out. In Luke chapter 10, I'm not going to read it, uh, oof. but in Luke chapter 10, uh, you know, we see that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the home of uh, Mary and Martha, right? In Luke chapter 10, and you'll remember that uh, uh, Mary had discovered the one Thing that was most important by choosing to sit at the feet of Jesus, right? We remember that uh, Martha, what Martha did wasn't wrong at, at all. We need people who are gifted like Martha, absolutely. But they can't be doing Martha's things without first getting to the feet of Jesus like Mary, right? We have to get at the, his feet first. She chose the one important thing. So, you know, don't, don't leave today. People at home, don't book a ticket to Bangladesh, right, or to Nigeria, you know, out of a, an emotional response to anything, or immediately, you know, I don't want anyone to go and immediately uh, set up a, a direct deposit every month to, you know, whatever missionary society or anything like that. Don't, don't do that. I mean, think about those things. Those might be things you need to think about doing, but the first thing that we need to do, everyone, is just hear from God, go to Jesus and say, here I am. What would you have me do? Um, there's a principle, oh, there's a lot of principles, but there, uh, one principle I would share uh, this morning from the word of God, Jesus told his disciples, Matthew chapter 28, uh, beginning in the second part of verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you, the promise, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Then he gave them a pattern in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then if you go through, we're not going to take the time to do it this morning, you Take the time to go through the acts of the apostles there within the word of God and you see how it comes to pass. The day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we see Jerusalem and Judea. In Acts chapter 8, Samaria. In Acts chapter 10, the Gentile nations uh, through Cornelius. And then the, uh, um, the uttermost parts of the world uh, thereafter. So... So in your, in your Jerusalem, right, uh, if that's King City, 
or if, if anyone else listening out there from wherever you're listening, whatever, wherever that might, uh, might be, wh what are you doing in, there? You know, what are you doing in your you know, Jerusalem? There are some people who feel called to the ends of the earth, but they're not doing anything here. You know, where, where, you know in, in their Jerusalem. It's to Jerusalem first. And then we have to ask the question, where is your Samaria? Uh, Samaria, within the text there, uh, Acts 1.8, is a term used for a, a distant uh, province that's populated by another people group. So your Samaria is maybe the side of the, uh, of the community that isn't your side. <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you don't traditionally or you haven't had much time for that part of our community and uh, our surroundings. Um, you know, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it could be a different group uh, socially or, uh, you know, or, you know, sometimes we have to reach out to those who have a different moral persuasion, don't we? <laughs> um, you know, or immoral persuasion uh, that we've maybe just despised. Uh, but that's our Samaria, if that makes sense. You know, there's a, there, there, there's a call from, you know, you know, there's a call from our own community. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, God's raising up a, a people. I, I believe that he's still raising a group of people. I know we're light today and everything, but he's raising a, a, up a group of people who are hearing that call. Not, all, not everyone's hearing it. Not everyone's hearing it, but there's, there's a call in many people's hearts that the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. The fields are ripe. The laborers are sometimes few. Uh, but, you know, and I would say that I'm not even, uh, I'm not even a great one uh, at times as far as being a laborer. Um, Zeph uh, I'm almost done. We're going to come to the table in just a moment. Zephaniah. I know, Zephaniah, not all the time, right? Chapter 3, verse 9, uh, Then I'll purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. Right? I'll purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. I think that's very interesting. You know, Isaiah had, you remember Isaiah? He had to have his lips purified, remember? We, we, that's how we started this off. And friends, the, the church needs to have its lips purified, cleansed. You know, we need to, oh, we all do, Christians. We need to have our, our lips cleansed for whatever we've said. And we need that cleansing before we can go out and do what needs to be done. Serving him. Our God, shoulder to shoulder. Um, you know, David said in Psalm 133, verse 1, Psalm 133, 1, uh, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Amen. And, you know, that specifically speaks to the tribes of Israel, that they live in harmony. But it also applies to us today as believers. Nothing can be sweeter than the love of Christ that you and I share with one another. Nothing. You know, we need the move of the Holy Spirit. The harvest is ready. Jesus said it. He meant it. But the, uh, the, the question to our hearts is, you know, will we uh, answer the call? And so I think uh, that's a good spot to uh, end this uh, particular series And we'll move on from here uh, next time. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to, with this in mind, we're going to come to the table. When um, our Lord and Savior died on the, uh, on the cross, we're uh, told, again, the, the Gospel of John, we're right there, right? You know, that... Uh, God sent his one and his only son into the world that none, none 
should perish. Uh, but the thought was that all who believe uh, might have eternal life. So, uh, friends, there are, uh, there's the call, uh, all these calls that we need to be hearing uh, in our lives, in our hearts. And uh, I hope that uh, as we come to the table, that's on our, our minds. Um, nothing I've said this morning diminishes the work of, of what we do here. Uh, you know, certainly there's a large scope where the church has to be. Um, it has to. But just like we see uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, we need that discipleship. We have to have an answer to that call of discipleship before we even hear the call for help that's out there. So the work of the church is vital. Discipleship is a vital part of the church, wherever it is. And so we need to continue with that. We, you know, it was part of our service this past week. It'll continue to be uh, what we do, meeting the needs of one another, meeting the needs of those uh, in the community. This, part of the purpose of the church was to participate in the Lord's Supper right? We're doing that. Part of the purpose of the church is to gather together and pray. We need some more work. <laughs> Let's be honest. We do. And you know, just gathering together to pray as, as believers. But uh, yeah, the work that we do, uh, we have to continue to give as we do. You know, we give within our state, we give nationally, we give internationally. We'll continue to do that, you know, so that discipleship can continue uh, in churches, uh, you know, in our state, in our nation, and around the world. You know, we, we, the work is good, and we have to continue to do that. When we come uh, to, uh, you know, the table this morning, uh, we remember that we, we're not doing it for ourselves. Uh, we're doing it because, you know, we love Jesus because we follow him, and because we do, we have the love of, we have Christ in us. We're, we're doing the work. We're, we're, you know, as Paul said, you know, to the church, you know, we are the hands. You know, we are the feet. We're the body. You know, and Christ is leading us, and we're doing that work for his name's sake, uh, for the sake of the gospel, and and that's what's going to change things, not only in our lives, but more importantly, in the lives of others. So let's go and uh, partake of these elements, and we're going to do so in remembrance of him. Let me, let me pray quick before we do. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for uh, these calls uh, to our hearts. I do pray, Lord, that we would hear them, that you'd give us a heart to hear them, that you'd give us ears of faith to hear these calls. Uh, you know, your, your call, you know, from the throne. Um, Lord, the call of, of those uh, souls who uh, are in torment. Uh, the call, Lord, of uh, the harvest, just knowing that there's still so many souls out here in the world who, who need to hear Starting right here, Lord, help us to hear the call here in our own community. Lord, uh, help us to hear the, the, you know, the, the greater uh, call outside our community and in this world, Lord. Um, I just pray that we would be able to respond. Um, I pray, Lord, that we would be a people who uh, less and less uh, we we find ourselves less and less responding, Lord, to the calls of fear and anxiety and worry and, you know, those calls of comfort and, and you know, and, and pleasure and all those things that would distract us from, you know, who we can be, who we should be, who you call us to be in you, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we come to the table this morning in remembrance of the sacrifice made so that we could live not for ourselves, but for you. We remember these things. We remember you.
Lord, uh, if there's th things in our hearts that need to be uh, exposed, uh, put away, uh, may it be so, Lord. Uh, we need to have our, our eyes opened and our ears opened, Lord, so that we can see and hear what's before us. Uh, we just bring these things uh, to you this day in, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, said uh, to the believers, uh, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, uh, took bread, and uh, he broke it, and, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, do this uh, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat of this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, um, we, uh, we thank you again. Lord, may uh, you continue to equip us and build us up as uh, uh, men, women who will uh, serve you faithfully and courageously, Lord. Um, help us to continue to speak boldly without shame um, the gospel that you've given us, Lord, the gospel that has changed our lives. Um, may we continue to proclaim your name speak your name to all who are here, um, that their lives might be changed and transformed by you, by your love, uh, by your power. Lord, um, uh, may we uh, continue, Lord, as a church to be uh, a light to this community. Um, may our uh, testimonies, Lord, be sure. May we uh, continue to live lives that show that we belong to you and we're a part of your family. May we uh, continue to invite, again, everyone who is here into the family, Lord, to know that they can be uh, adopted, become a son or a daughter of the living God. Um, we, just, uh, we just bring these things before you this day, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for giving us all and each opportunity that you gave. In Jesus' name.